pretty remarkable the number of animals that are endemic uh, to this area. Uh, they, um, um, so if we look at the subcontinent uh, continent of Africa, there are 66 known species of pachydactylid and geckos and 64 of them occur in Southern Af Africa. And uh, when we look at the Namib desert on the whole, it's a very old desert. So it's been dry for millions of years, perhaps five million years, uh, but it has been a true desert, I mean, it, uh, an entity as a desert for about two million years. So it's much older than our Sonoran Desert by a good bit. When we look at endemic species on the whole in the uh, Southern Africa subregion, you're looking at high incidence of a variety of things, including tortoises, um, uh, small adders, and, uh, and geckos and, and other lizards. So it's a really remarkable place in that context. And when we compare it with the Snoran Desert, we're looking at our desert being about 9,500 years old. Again, when compared with uh, Africa or uh, the Namib in Southern Africa being around 2 million years old. So as an entity, they've been along, uh, around a lot longer. The whole idea that um, this research Brandt brought out is think of sand basically like water on a beachfront and the movement of that water, those tidal events, the sand is doing the same thing. And just like you get organisms isolated at high tide uh, in tide pools and that are liberated or at low tide in tide pools, they are liberated again when the high tides move in and they can move out from that. That is basically what happens again and again in the African subcontinent. So when we look at uh, Pachydactylus as a whole, this is not every species, but this is darn close to every species that's found in the subcontinents where their distributions laid over one another. And when we look at just the species that have smaller distributions, you see this pattern of isolated animals here and here and here, just little pools of these animals that have uh, persisted, things like Marazii here on the um, upper Namibian coast. So the whole idea is how did these things get there and, and, and what was the mechanism driving the speciation? And what we have is at, during periods, during, uh, you know, over periods of millions of years, you have the sand make these ingresses inland. And it virtually covers the whole subcontinent, not entirely, but it comes darn close to it. And with it comes all these arenophilus species that are following these sands inland. Then, um, then as the uh, sand stabilizes, these species fan out, uh, represented by the green dots and arrows, and they migrate into these areas. And all the uh, highland species, the saxophilus species, if you will, the red dots, are isolated in these islands here and there while the sand species are moving about. Then the sand retreats, isolating the uh, arenophilus species in these little islands here and there. And the uh, saxophilus species are able to move around again. And so this occurs again and again and again. And what you end up with are these pattern of these species that have now occur in these very small isolated uh, spots and, uh, and the same thing with both sand and rock loving species. Uh, so this is kind of the crew that I worked with most of the time. Uh, here's Johan Murray over on the far left. There's Paul Moeller, many of you recognize him. Uh, there's the substantial Aaron Bauer uh, working there as probably the foremost gecko uh, specialist in the world. And these are all students and other folks that are along assisting with the, uh, the research. And uh, this core team stayed the same most of the time and the students kind of came and went. Some of them are now professors at different universities around that have made their own way uh, into the, um, the acad academia. Here's, uh, here's the crew again uh, or during one of the trips pointing to uh, Johan's car. Uh, we were driving across the Trans Botswana Highway at about at about 95 miles an hour, and he hit a cow. Uh, remarkably, no one was killed. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, I've had the um, pleasure of surviving many 
near-death experience with Johan, as I have with some of my other friends. I noticed Cecil was online here. Uh, we've shared a few over the years. And uh, uh, we managed to limp into town, get that fixed. The amazing thing was that a bush mechanic strut, uh, straightened that strut to probably within a millimeter or two where it was at factory settings with a blowtorch and a hammer. Uh, anyway, that was good, as, good enough to get us into a bend hook where we got the strut replaced. So here's the first little endemic guy that we're looking at. And we're gonna start at the top of the subcontinent and move southward. And this is used to be known as Kaoko Gecko, but this work, um, what it did was uh, when we start, when uh, Drs. Bowers and Lamb started looking at all these different geckos, you had these animals that looked very, very different, but they were actually very closely allied. And uh, they, um, and they ended up uh, being lumped into the genus Pachydactylus. So this used to be Kaoko gecko was the genus, and now it's Pachydactylus. And this is uh, the um, uh, uh, Kaoko gecko uh, vanzilii. And uh, you can see that it has these little web feet. It inhabits gravel plains, um, but it, ecologically is very similar to the palmetto gecko. Uh, but uh, uh, a, um, a more northern equivalent. And these are the type of habitats that we were sampling. So this is where uh, palmetto gecko or kaoko gecko vanzilii uh, lives, or the kaoko web-footed gecko. And um, the, again, which is now pachydactylus vanzilii. These uh, fossilized sand dunes here, the animals were found out on these gravel, uh, gravel plains, but we had the best luck where these fossilized sand dunes butted up against these mountains. The skeleton coast is literally right over the top of those mountains, so we're on the inland side of them. And there were little sand washes that came out from these ravines. And uh, once we got over there and started looking for them, they were really abundant. But they were scattered on and off through these more uh, coarser uh, soils. This is uh, uh, these, a lot of these species on the west coast of Namibia, as you are familiar, are these uh, fog desert species. And here's a fog bank came, coming over the mountains near the Minutum River. Uh, we're camped out on this gravel plain. And, uh, and many of the animals, no matter how cold it is, will come out and bask when there's a fog. So if you have a really cold night, and it is almost always cold on that skeleton coast and uh, uh, the co uh, uh, coast of Namibia there, the um, uh, you'll, uh, no matter how cool it is, it seems like these things will come up and fog bash. And some of the temperatures I was taking, uh, uh, air temperatures and body temperatures, these animals were right around 40 degrees, upper 30s, um, and they would be out at night moving around or at least uh, drinking the fog. We'd see lots of things like um, these little horned adders, Bittus caudalis, uh, wherever you went, their appearance changed. They were they're beautiful little snakes, uh, very much like our sidewinders, but not so obligate in the, uh, in the sandy soils. You'd find them on rocky hillsides, other places. Uh, maybe my favorite animal in Namibia is on the skeleton coast there in these big dune fields, and they live on the slip faces of these dunes. Um, they remind me of chuckwallas, but they don't do anything like chuckwallas other than they're about that size and they tend to be, have very good eyesight. This is Johan and I. We're probably 200 feet plus above the valley floor. These bushes you see down here are the size of large creosotes. And uh, the lizards we've been chasing are up on these dune faces. Uh, when they see you, they literally burrow down into the dunes and disappear. And uh, they're very difficult to catch because they see you from a long ways off. And you have to plunge your hand into the place where the first little disturbance is. If you miss them, they spiral down and corkscrew out of reach and you never get them. So this is Angolasaurus, or it used to be Angolasaurus, it's now uh, uh, um, Gurosaurus scugii. Um, maybe one of the most highly specialized lizards I've ever seen in my life. They were uh, removed from the genus Angolasaurus because of the work that we did uh, catching them. And uh, they found out that they're basically just a super highly evolved gurusaur rather than something in their own genus. Another little animal is, is oops, uh, Periscutatus. 
And this is a uh, name of this one. This is a species that was discovered during the research. And it's a pun or on the name Pachydaclus scutatus, which it strongly resembles. And it was found up here only around the area of Gaius, or Gaius, or not, excuse me, not Gaius, uh, Cesfontaine, and to living, living in rock crevices. And so a cryptic species, again, that was revealed through uh, Dr. Bowers and uh, Lamb's research that was collected on these trips. Here we have uh, another picture, or we have Pachydaclus scutatus, the lookalike species, which has a much broader distribution than the previous one uh, that, uh, that it resembles. Uh, Pachydaclus oreophilus, um, is another uh, gecko that uh, we sampled. And again, up in the Cesfontaine Ses area. Matter of fact, when uh, Pachydaclus periscutatus was discovered, we were actually collecting Oreophilus. And uh, these animals, uh, very little is known about their ecology, uh, how they go about living. They live in incredibly dry, harsh places. One of the things you see with the pachydaclid geckos is oftentimes the juveniles, like this one, uh, look very, very different than the adults. And so uh, uh, one species or another, they often all share um, this, um, this, uh, um, this kind of black and white uh, uh, banded type pattern. And you see different forms of it for each species, but many, many of them are similar. Okay, so uh, here's uh, another picture of, of Oreophilus here, and you can see that he's got a little bit of a juvenile pattern. As they get bigger, that oftentimes fades altogether. Another animal we encountered up in that way are uh, tiger snakes, which are uh, very much like uh, our liar snakes. They're mildly uh, venomous like our liar snakes, and they live in very much the same habitat. And we see Telescopus beatsi or Polystictus or, or um, uh, another species that doesn't come to mind right now, depending on where we're at. Up there while we were working, we also caught this Canini racer, uh, Kluber zebrinus. I think it's actually gone into another genus now, but this was the third specimen known for this snake that we ran and we happened to collect it while we were out on those trips. And we, got, we had several animals that were rediscovered during uh, these expeditions or uh, were, there were so few specimens known that it was a second or third. Uh, specimen of them um, of that species ever seen. This is pretty typical for that country in northern Namibia and you have these big rock faces and this open uh, kind of hilly rocky stuff but anywhere you stop there there's one species or another of gecko living in that country. This is a, as you head north a little bit from there, you, you reach this area called the Marian Fluce, which is real poorly collected and very poorly understood. Um, it's just as you come up on the Angola border and along the Kanini River. And uh, again, lots of things there that were not very well understood. Uh, we'd be stopped in the middle of nowhere collecting and uh, himbas would come on up and uh, visit with us while we were working and we would trade with them for jewelry or canned goods or whatever it happened to be. Um, here's a, uh, one of the uh, typhlidae that you see uh, there in Africa. Some of them can get really large, but this is very much like our blind snakes or thread snakes that we have here. Lots of uh, burrowing skinks. So Tiflosaurus brain, brain eye is a coastal species that burrows in those coastal dunes. Usually you can rake them out of the sand near uh, uh, the bases of bushes. Um, here we have Pachydaclus gaius, and you can see by the spot here, it's a little bit inland. And uh, this is uh, just around this Mesum crater area. And again, very poorly understood, understood you might have read some articles about a place called the Brandberg or Brandberg Mountain uh, there in Namibia. And in fact, they discovered a whole new order of insects on that mountain range about 10 or 12 years ago, if I remember correctly. But again, it's, it's very poorly researched, not many people in there, really difficult to get to, very remote. Uh, this is where that gecko lives. And so this is what that country, a lot of that country looks like. 
still most of this uh, country has not been uh, worked or collected in or surveyed uh, well at all for herps or small mammals. Um, uh, it's just kind of tierra incognita. You can see there's big gravel plains interspersed with uh, these low hills. Uh, Wellwishia lives there. Uh, it's pretty common out in that stuff. But you can see, you know, there's a Wellwishia plant every 60, 70 yards out there. Uh, this is the kind of habitat, habitat that Gaia census lives in, or these big sandstone block uh, formations out there. And you'll just come to these things. They'll be isolated sitting out on those uh, sandy uh, plains, but there's uh, several different things in here. Here's a juvenile Gaia census, and you can see how much it look like, looks like Oreopolis. Again, showing that uh, juvenile pattern that a lot of these pachydactylid geckos share. Here's Gaia census again. Um, maybe one of the geckos I like best looking for just because it was such a cool area to be in. There's the habitat again. So uh, one of the things we'd run into occasionally are these things that are very much like shovel nose snakes, except for they live in the rocky hillsides. And so we would see um, uh, prosimnia and we've got viscerae and frontalis but again, on these rocky sloped hillsides, the viscera uh, we got was, again, one of the very few specimens ever found at that time. I think some more have turned up since then. More uh, uh, burrowing skinks. This is lineata. Again, very poorly represented in collections. This was up in that sandy area near in the Marion Flus. Here's the gravel plains in the evening. A typical camping spot while we're out in the field. You just stop where you happen to be and then go out and work at night. We'd all, uh, all gravitate towards these uh, hills because this is where uh, we're working mainly with geckos, but you'd find stuff out on the plains too. Here's Pachydactylus punctatus. This is the little guy that you would find not only on those rocky slopes, but out in the plains, especially if it out in the flats or any little rock piles or anything. You see Gamma atra, rock agamas, uh, quite commonly. We run across very, very sundry tortoises, different places we were. This is one of the endemic species, uh, Oculifera. Puff adders were widely uh, spread throughout that country. You'd find them most anywhere, but remarkably, puff adders and many of the other venomous snakes are actually really difficult to find in Africa. And I think uh, some of you folks I know uh, have collected in Africa and worked there. And uh, anytime I have friends over from Africa, they're always marvel how easy rattlesnakes are to find in, uh, in Arizona, just as opposed to snakes are in Africa. This is a puff adder track. Um, actually, this photo was taken at the Gobobab Research Station. That little rut right down the center of the crawl is the tail where it drags just the tip of it touches down as the snake moves. Um, but uh, this rectilinear motion like we see with a lot of our big diamondbacks and whatnot is pretty common for those snakes. Uh, out on those gravel plains that seem featureless, you find this large chameleon that is 10 inches, 12 inches long, um, and that's uh, the Namaqua chameleon. It's a terrestrial chameleon, you don't see it climbing much, but it's a, uh, it's a big animal uh, that you might encounter almost anywhere out there. At night you would find them uh, huddled up against a stone or some other object typically, just kind of hunched over, uh, sleeping right on the surface in this kind of habitat. Uh, also out there in the flats as evening falls, the barking geckos start calling. And that's one of my favorite geckos out there just because of that neat call and their whole lifestyle. They live in burrows. Uh, right as dusk falls, they start calling. They remind me a lot of uh, cricket frogs when they call. They, their call sounds like two stones hitting together, kind of a gick, 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 gick call. And they pop their heads out, call, and then duck back in. Uh, lots of Samophis species, which are much like our whip snakes out here. And uh, these geckos, the uh, uh, Turners, Bibroni, Fitzmunzii, and they now got, a, uh, I think they've got two or three more species. They're all very similar. All of these were in Pachydactylus, but these got moved over to the genus Chondrodactylus because of the work that was done during this, uh, this project. And basically what it boils down to is all these African geckos with white spots 
where the males have white spots on them, they are all got moved over to the genus uh, Chondrodactylus. We see uh, Chordylosaurus quite frequently um, and out in the most god awful places for this seemingly fragile little lizard. Uh, lots of different uh, skinks like Hoashai. Uh, here's Shirzy's thick toed gecko, uh, one of the animals that were, uh, you'd find under Cow Creek out in Sandy Flats. And Fasciatus, again, same kind of situation, wider spread. Uh, I like small mammals, so seeing elephant shrews, uh, like this round eared elephant shrew, were, was always uh, a real exciting for me, a real thrill to see those. Again, another color phase of horned adder. Seems like everywhere you went, you'd find, uh, you know, they match the background just beautifully and were always really pretty animals. Um, here's another one. Oh. Uh, here's a, a, a Camellio dilepis, the flat neck chameleon. Once we got north of the Tropic of uh, Capricorn, we saw them much more frequently. They tended to like a little bit more mesic areas. They go way down into South Africa, but in Namibia, when you got up uh, towards uh, uh, Windhoek, they seem to be much more abundant. Here's a uh, Pella medusa, one of the side neck turtles. I don't think this one's subroofer anymore. Um, and of course, a Spitaleps uh, lugubris, the one of the Cape coral snake. They, you know, uh, 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 typical lapid for that, that country. Here's evening over in a place called Red Drum uh, where we collected. Um, and again, another species of cobra. We encountered snouted cobras. Here's the velvety thick uh, gecko uh, bicolor. And again, you can see that same juvenile pattern again. These juvenile pachydaclis can be very, very confusing. Here's uh, um, a, uh, another Agama, Actricolis. I can't remember the common name on this one, but anyway, uh, fairly common. All these Agamas have really large teeth in the front of their mouth. They're like a, they've got a, they feel like pliers with a bottle opener on the end when you get bit, really unpleasant. Uh, thick-toed gecko, uh, uh, the uh, rough thick-toed gecko. This little guy would typically be in really sandy areas, and if you could find a dead tree, it would be under the bark or inside the rotted wood. Uh, a really beautiful little animal. I never saw one with a complete tail. Uh, kind of curious what it looks like there, but all the ones I've ever seen have, have a regenerated tail. Uh, the uh, python dipsis, typically rocky areas, often really uh, desolate areas, but also out in the gravel plains, and uh, they're supposed to be under the, the leaf well witchia and in dead well wishes, but I never saw one uh, that way, uh, not, mind you, for lack of looking. This is another really remarkable gecko that I really enjoy looking for. This is Pachydaclus cocky, or uh, Cox thick-toed gecko. And uh, they live, again, up here in northern Namibia in these little uh, sandy or these little cobble plains. Um, they uh, are very attenuate uh, and lightsome. And uh, we employ binoculars with a little light under it to catch the eye shine when we're looking for geckos at night. And you can see these things from 60, 70 yards away and walk up on them. Out in these gravel plains, you get a lot of reflection from quartz and other shiny things, so it can be confusing. Uh, but they're, again, they're just wonderful little animals to see. This is the type of habitat for them and carp's barking gecko and uh, several other uh, geckos and lizards, along with horned adders again. Here's carp's uh, barking gecko. The males of all the barking geckos have yellow throats. And uh, I, th I was musing on that the other night. I think that's interesting because when they're calling from the holes, they just protrude their heads. And when they bark, their head bounces up and down. So I wonder if that yellow throat isn't more easily picked up by the female or perhaps as a warning to other males or what. But I'm sure there's some kind of reason why they have it and the females don't. This is Pachydaclus murazi, and uh, that was a species that would dis was again discovered and described from these works and uh, uh, this project and was named after Johann Murray. Um, and uh, it lives right in that same area where the, uh, the uh, previous species of geckos, but 
you hit this band of these boulders out there, and this is where that animal is. And looking on Google Earth, this band does not extend long. So it remains to be seen if uh, Murray's bar, uh, thick-toed gecko is found only in these boulders in that one isolated spot or has a little bit uh, larger distribution. But going by the habitat alone, it's a very, very limited distribution. Here he is again. And uh, lots of day geckos. So these uh, retropus are uh, different species like Bradfield eye and um, afer and whatnot. Uh, some are living on rocks, some are living out on the sand. Uh, afer is a species that actually uh, lives out on the sand and it, the uh, terminal digit uh, or a segment of the phalanx is able to uh, move upward at 90 degrees so the scanters don't get all gummed up with uh, sand and stuff while they're running across it. Here's another Simopus, uh, uh, Namaquensis. This is a really variable snake. Every time I see this thing, it fools me. I think it's something different because they look different every time I see them. Here's Afer, the little guy that, whose toe can uh, cock up at a 90 degree angle. He lives on the sand, Bradfield eye or um, and some of the, most of the other species are on rocks. Here's Pachydaclus servili. Again, a, a broader, much broader distribution for most of these Pachydaclus. And as we head down the coast, we get uh, further south, down and we hit the montane uh, uh, thick-toed gecko or Pachydaclus montanus. Has a pretty good distribution, but it's li uh, limited to these inland uh, rocky mountains um, that uh, they're in Namibia and northern, extreme northern South Africa. Here's a, a really good example of that animal. This is the type of habitat where we collected them and uh, they would typically be in rock crevices or under cap rocks. So it was very much like looking for night lizards here in Arizona. Uh, they live in those type of situations. And in fact, uh, growing up looking for night lizards in Arizona really aided uh, in finding these things because uh, you already had a good idea what lizards usually like to be under and depending on the temperatures where they'd be at. So uh, herping in Namibia and Southern Africa for the most part is very much like herping in Arizona. And if any of you went out there uh, and looking for these animals, you would have a good idea of where to go just based on your experiences here at home. Here's a, uh, Pachydaclus werneri, and uh, again, one of the, a little bit broader distribution, oops, excuse me, uh, of the Pachydaclid, but again, you can see the diversity and, and how similar so many of these things are. So we're heading down towards uh, Aus, or no, excuse me, not uh, Aus, over towards uh, Luteritz. This is pretty typical of a lot of the habitat. Uh, here's another uh, shield-nosed cobra, Escutatus little stocky things. They look like a banded sand snake with a hood. I mean, they're built like a rough scale banded sand snake, really stocky little animals. Here's a Pachydaclus capensis, has a very large distribution of the Pachydaclids, often associated with termite mounds. Here's a, a Trachelepis sparsa, um, again, one of the many skinks there in that whole group, Trachelepis. Uh, occasionally, we'd run across pythons, and they've been split all up. So everything used to be uh, African rock pythons, and now there's Natalensis, and I think one other one that the rock pythons have gotten split into. Uh, typically in a little bit more music areas, as you can see with this, uh, this photograph. So uh, another favorite of mine is Pachydaclus rangei. This used to be uh, um, uh, a different genus, but again, was lumped in because of this, this work. Um, you can see by the, the feet how different it is than the other thick-toed geckos. And they live out in these big open, uh, often featureless dunes uh, in, uh, in Namibia, uh, almost all the way down to the South Africa border. <clears throat> this is pretty typical of the habitat. This is some dunes near Ruibank, uh, a really fun place to collect and work um, at night. You walk these dunes looking for these geckos, but also lots of other things that you might encounter, like uh, Paranguay's adders. Uh, interestingly, uh, I noticed on one of the last few trips I was on that we were finding Paraguayan adders with kind of three different colors of tail. So they'd either have a yellow 
ish creamy yellow uh, tail, or they would have a black tail, or they'd have this kind of gray blue tail. Um, they are supposed to use the tail for caudal luring. I've never witnessed that, but uh, and I would, could only imagine all the tails work well, but I'm not sure why you would have different color tails in all of them or in them. So they have these really specialized eyeballs so they can bury the whole animal and just the eyes are above the sand. And it's, uh, um, I've never seen it, but I've been with people that say they've spotted them by the eye shine. I don't know how they do that because their eyes aren't very big. They're a small snake, but still uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, uh, Tiflacontius is another genus of uh, these fossorial skinks that you find. Um, these things are basically acting like our shovel nose and sand snakes for all practical purposes. They're doing basically the same thing. They appear to be following or filling that ecological niche in these dune fields, but you really don't have a lot of small fossorial snakes, but you have a lot of these small fossorial skinks. Here's that area again. Uh, one of my, uh, probably my absolute favorite gecko are these big um, chondrodactylus angulifer, these uh, giant ground geckos. And they're, oh, uh, six, seven inches long for a really large one. Again, just stalking the dunes at night. But you can see those white, this is a male, and these white spots that you see on all the chondrodactylus that's uh, characteristic for that males in that genus. This is a really beautiful gecko, just found around a Grabi's Fall, and it was uh, described from this work again, uh, and, uh, and the type specimen was collected during this work. Uh, Pachydactylus a torquatus, I thought was just a really handsome animal, typically uh, in rocky outcrops, not on mountain slopes though. So there would be ravines and washes with rocky outcrops and, this, and these geckos were utilizing those. Um, and so the habitat you see at the top of the picture is the kind of stuff with Pachydactylus a torquatus would be in. This is a Grabi's Falls, a famous spot uh, there on the Africa Namibia border. Uh, you can see uh, Platysaurus broadly eye there all over the rock, beautiful lizard, um, really abundant in that area. And here we see uh, Chondrodactylus vibronii, which is, again, white spots. So typical for males in the genus. Widely scattered, but as you move around the subcontinent, this thing that looks like big bronii is going to change species and uh, little things like uh, scales on the mental or the mental uh, parts here in the chin. And a few other characters distinguish them as different species along with genetics. Oops. Um, okay, so this is Pachydactylus austini. You can see the blue down here. He kind of picks up in southern Namibia and runs down the coast, kind of filling in the niche where um, uh, palmetto gecko does, but now, uh, but uh, a little bit more heavily vegetated dunes because you don't have those big sand seas like you do in other parts of, uh, uh, like you do in Namibia. So you can see these are much more lush, succulent dunes, with lots of things going on here. Um, again, walking around at night, you just pick them up with uh, using flashlights or again, the binoculars and flashlight techniques. There's lots of these little Bradipodian oxidentali, and it's kind of a contest to see how many you can count at night. I think I got really close to 50 one evening in a couple hours. Uh, they sleep on the vegetation. I, I'm not, I don't think I've ever seen more than one or two during the day. At night, you can find them everywhere, but they're just invisible during the day in that vegetation. Here's one sleeping on a, on a branch at night. Uh, another thing we'd run across while we were uh, collecting geckos there are uh, breviceps. <clears throat> this is the uh, desert rain frog. It lives on those coastal dunes there. And lots of Marolis, um and uh, different species. So this is reticulatus. Um, here's a tinnodactylus. They all have kind of shovel nose snouts and they all have fringes or nearly all of them have fringes on their toes. So we think of our umas being super highly specialized when you see those characters very widely, widely distributed across this group of lizards in Africa. And uh, uh, my first trips there, I was really interested to see these ecological equivalents, but uh, these characters are much more broadly expressed with it being such a, a so much older system. You've had more things evolve these specializations. 
Here's another, uh, uh, a contus or, or burrowing skink, comes in two different colors. And here's vermis, again, looks very much like brain eye, but it's, uh, it's another very attenuate burrowing skink in the coastal area. This lizard I just love, uh, doesn't look like it can make up its mind what it wants to look like, uh, but there's a lot of lizards in the genus Nucris, and uh, this one in particular I just think is, is really, uh, really spectacular. Here's a, um, a uh, Namaqua dwarf adder, uh, Bitta schneideri in situ. And so this is when they burrow in, uh, you find them like this. Oftentimes they're way into these ice plants, these mesembryums, um, and or sometimes they're burrowed in and just the very tip of their heads out and they're impossible to see like this. Um, and so they're the world's smallest adder and they're found there along the coast, again, one of the specialized species up around Port Nolith in the dunes there. They seem to be pretty abundant. We see them pretty much every time we go, if we spend any time at all looking for them. But they act, they're basically doing the same thing Paraguay eye does to the north. They burrow in the sand, they're ambush predators, uh, seem to feed predominantly on geckos, and I, I suppose those rain frogs too. So here's the crew, uh, and it always reminds me of the Four Peaks area, boulder fields, uh, except for without swarrows or cacti. Um, when you get in the crew, you pick up a lot of different things. Uh, angulate tortoises become much more common. They barely make it into northern Namibia, but in the coastal areas, they're downright abundant. Um, I think one day we saw 30 of them just driving from one place to another. Real interesting natural history on these. They lay uh, one or two eggs, several times during the year. So they're acting much more like an Uda um, and they're relatively short lived. So uh, they may lay 10 eggs or so during the season, but they're done in these small little nesting bouts throughout the warm season. Uh, lots of great plants, of course, in Africa, like uh, Alodicotoma and another great uh, Cordylid, um, Ouroboros, which was uh, again, separated out by Bauer at all from the work we did here, uh, collecting uh, some of these other species uh, in addition to the uh, pachydaclid work. Uh, here is another specialized little adder that's only found in Southern Africa. This is the mini horned adder and uh, really beautiful little snakes, but again, in those rocky Karoo hillsides around Springbok in the general area. Uh, uh, another uh, endemic species, the speckled padloper, uh, very much like pancake tortoises, and they live in these rocky hillsides, kind of slide into crevices and under rocks and things like that. Of course, leopard tortoises are very broadly distributed across the subcontinent, and more skinks, uh, the cape skink, capensis. Sun gazers are another uh, cordylid that are um, uh, that are very specialized, uh, really interesting and different than the other cordylids. They live in burrows out in big grassy plains. And uh, some of the work, there's not been a lot of work on them, but some of the work is showing that during heavy rain periods during the winter, um, that their burrows will fill up with water and they basically swim to the top and lay there in the water with their heads out, but they will not leave the burrow. And if they're disturbed like that, then they swim to the bottom, just like if, they, if it was dry, they move to the bottom of the burrow, hold their breath for a while and then come back up. And so uh, a really fascinating lizard that's actually been heavily persecuted for the pet trade. Uh, another specialized, uh, very isolated little uh, uh, gersor. This is the blue spotted uh, girdled lizard lives uh, in some of the Cape Fold Mountains there in this type of habitat uh, in the rocks and whatnot. This is a gecko named after Bill Branch who uh, worked on the projects, uh, was along on most of the trips. This is Rami gecko or the Schwarzberg uh, leaf toad gecko. Um, pretty good sized animal but lives in the habitat that we looked at previously. Um, and uh, I, that animal was not described during this project. It was done later with a different project. Uh, oscillated thick-toed gecko. And uh, Pseudocardylus microlepis is a good-sized lizard, nearly chuckwalla size. 
uh, acts very much like a chuck wall, uh, uh, but not so tied to the crevices like boulder piles, whatnot. We see miscellaneous uh, mammals of varying interest on the trip, like this uh, clip springer. This is, here you can see Johan and uh, uh, down here uh, looking for, um, uh, this is looking for uh, a gecko that lives on these big uh, rock faces and they're just god awful steep. Uh, it's uh, Aphrodura, uh, the uh, Hakwa flat gecko. They are the kind of euphemistically known as galaxy geckos. They're just remarkably beautiful, but uh, we clambered around those slopes at night um, looking for them and would spot them typically by eye shine on these big rock faces, but it was, it was just miserable looking for them because uh, if you left, lost your footing, you know, you just, just seems like, I'm sure you would have got hung up somewhere between where you were at and the bottom, but it sure didn't seem like it. <clears throat> As we move south, uh, you get a lot of these, uh, especially to the south, you start picking up a lot of these little endemic uh, uh, chameleons with these uh, dwarf chameleons with these very isolated distributions. So this, uh, this is a pumilium around Cape Town there, um, a really beautiful little uh, uh, chameleon. Here you can see the distribution of uh, uh, oculatus, another one of the pachydactyl geckos that starts cropping up in these Cape Fold Mountains, which are, you can see is a series of, of ridges there by the coast. Yeah, you get uh, things like this is another little endemic uh, uh, fraxless uh, um, uh, um, uh, casina that you find here in the, uh, uh, the Southern Africa. Here's Perfla, you can see has a much larger distribution but again, one of these endemic geckos. Another one of the uh, dwarf chameleons, that's an endemic that's found right down uh, near the southern end of the Cape in a very small area. Another rain frog that's found in that same area and another endemic. And here's Maculatus and you start going around the coast here and working up the other side uh, these were lumped in with the rough uh, geckos, uh, rugosus at one time, but that's, that rugosus has been split up into a bigger complex. This animal came out, at, uh, came out of it, and its distribution goes nearly up to Mozambique, uh, this particular gecko. So much broader distribution than a lot of the other ones. But anyway, we've gone all the way around the horn here, and... Um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything that I can answer or help with. Um, so I'm gonna end the show. Thank I you know. very much, Randy. That was one of the <clears throat> best talks we've had in a long time. Well, thank you. It was kind of a whirlwind. I'm sorry we had to go through it so quick, but don't wanna bore you all to death. <clears throat> there are plenty of questions uh, before we get to that, um, we have to let you know about the um, election results. And uh, I'm just going to uh, tell you what they are, just to keep things running smoothly here. Um, that the membership uh, affirmed the slate unanimously. So... Um, Congratulations to us <laughs> uh, and the slate. Um, we have a, a board for 2021. So, all right. Um, so I've already got some uh, questions here in the chat box. Um, if you don't know how to use that and you'd like to, um, the bottom of your window, there's a chat um, button. If you click on that, you can type a question uh, to me or any of the co-hosts privately or publicly, and uh, we will get those questions to, to Randy. Um, I have to, uh, we have a very special attendee uh, from Georgia and uh, of Wick Gibbons, and he has a question 
Um, let's see if he will. He raised his hand, but let's. Wit, you can go ahead and uh, just. I'll unmute you and. Um, I I really didn't have a question. I thought that was a fantastic presentation, though. Thank but you. Wit. It's really good. Thank you very much. Randy always gives a good talk. <laughs> it's just so nice to see you. Thank you for showing up. Yeah, you bet. Wit, uh, thanks for, for joining us. I have, um, I inherited a copy of your book on the herps of the Savannah River lab area uh -huh. uh, that you had written out to Justin Schmidt. Do you know Justin? Remember Justin Schmidt? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I ended up with that book. Good. Well, I'm glad. All right. Awesome. And Thank it was great seeing Randy. Are you still there, Randy? Yeah, I am. I don't. I. 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 I'm stymied by technology again, so I'm just trying to figure out how to make everything. Well, work. But I am here. Well, I, I will tell you, Parker and Michael are watching this also. I don't know where they are on this thing, but uh, anyway. Great. We have um, we had up to 49 uh, guests tonight, so that's really wonderful. That's uh, probably the biggest audience we've had <laughs> for the Herp Society. Um, <laughs> Brian Sullivan, fantastic talk, Randy. Thanks. Do you have a sense of any black, white, noxious critters that the smaller geckos might resemble or mimic, or is it disruptive? That's, that's a great question. So uh, there's not been anything done that I'm aware of on the geckos is precisely, but there has been a lot done on the different nucleus. And uh, that subtessellata and another species are supposed to mimic anthea, which is a big carabid that has very nasty chemical defenses. And it's quite possible, I hadn't occurred to me before, but Brian makes a great point, that those little geckos are trying to look like anthea of one species or another also. Uh, in fact, uh, if you get on YouTube, you can see pictures of those little nucleus. When they run, they actually hump back, uh, hunch up their backs so they look like beetles when they run, and they, they mimic that movement. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Uh, I have a similar question. I noted the um, a lot of the um, white spots on the lateral surface of lizards. You tend to see that in a lot of lizard species. E e there's even a famous tropical lizard species. Have you postulated or guessed uh, what those might serve a function for? You know, again, you're, uh, you guys are asking way too intelligent questions for me. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody's actually done anything with that. Uh, but um, it's, uh, uh, you do see a lot of that punctated pattern. And, uh, you know, whether it's just cryptic coloration or there's something beyond or some kind of conspecific communication amongst them. I, I really don't know. And perhaps Dr. Bauer has written something about it. You know, uh, um, you know, we could always email him and try to find out uh, if he's, he's decided it's got any particular uh, use. But that punctated pattern, like you see in Murray's eye and punctatus and um, a few of those other things, really common. Um. Let's see, Willem de Roos uh, asks, are there any varanids in Southern Africa? Yes, uh, so uh, 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 Albo Labrus or uh, Albo Galeris, I'm getting my mix Vietnam and, and uh, African herbs mixed up. Uh, that was the one we'd see most often, but we see uh, um, uh, water monitors occasionally uh, when you're near the rivers. But uh, especially out in a lot of that really dry country, you know, uh, uh, the white-throated monitor um, is, is the guy uh, when you see him. And more often than not, I'd see him roadkill, but occasionally you'd run across him live. Um, Maggie uh, Fusari asks, are the Gerosaurus, would you consider them sand swimmers? Yes, and, and so, uh, again, you know, my... my favorite animal over there. Uh, the adaptations that you see on that one lizard when you have them in hand uh, just 
uh, I, I, any biologist, any appreciator of herps would just be, it's just overwhelming. If you turn them over on their, and look at their belly, the ventral scales are healed like runners on a sled. And when you watch them through binoculars, because you can never get close enough just to watch them with your naked eye, but if you watch them through binoculars, they paddle along the dunes on their belly, kind of like an otter does in a slide. So they're laying on their belly and they're just moving themselves along with their, their uh, legs and their tail is typically arched up over their back, almost like a scorpion would uh, carry its tail, but it's, it, they can't uh, bend it to that degree. So it's curled up. And, uh, and then, of course, there's a countersunk jaw, ear flaps, interlocking eyelids, uh, nasal valves, and a wedge-shaped uh, snout. So, yeah, they, uh, they, they swim. And when they are alarmed, they dive into the sand just like an like a otter does into the water. Um, they feed on insects that are there, like uh, some of the darkling beetles, the different tanebs and vegetation that's blown in by the uh, do or the winds interior. So really remarkable critters, but, but really adept at swimming in the sand. And that corkscrew spiral down, I'm not sure what that's about, but uh, they just disappear. If you, like I said, if you are plunge your hand in there and you just touch them, don't grab them, they're gone. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, so do you also, Ma Maggie also asked, do you, Grab sand swimming or sand dwelling things with your hands. And if you're raking the sand, do you risk being nailed by a venomous snake? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Uh, you do run that risk. It's never happened yet. But um, yes, you, you, know, you uncover things, uh, sometimes inadvertently. A lot of times, uh, a technique that works pretty good, um, and it's kind of stolen from Paul Muller, is to wear a glove, uh, typically a heavy glove on one hand, your digging hand, and then use your other hand to grab. Uh, and, uh, and oftentimes with those small skinks, if you have a bucket or something nearby that you can just grab a handful of sand that contains the animal and drop it in the bucket and then sort it out, that works fairly well. But yeah, Paringue's adders and those Schneider eye, uh, they're around and I'm kind of always thinking about that when I'm digging around in there. But uh, you know, I don't know if that would be bad luck to uncover one that way or good luck. As long as you didn't get bit, it would be good luck, I guess. <clears throat> How venomous are the are the uh, vipers? Those vipers are very small. So that Schneider eye is about an eight inch animal. Hmm. And so it's a tiny little snake and Paringuay eye is not much bigger. Uh, Caudalis, uh, typically, you know, they might be 11, 12 inches or so, uh, you know, total length. And by the time you get to Aryan Tans, you know, you're talking about a shortish snake, you know, two foot, maybe a little bit bigger for most of the ones I've seen, but very, very heavy and an and a incredibly violent strike. Maybe one of the most violent strikes I've ever seen on a, on a viper, a really savage, but, uh, and, and they, it actually kind of makes a snapping sound when they hit the end of the strike. And I've asked several people about it because I've heard it and I, I kind of think it's just my imagination, but everybody says, yeah, you're hearing that, that make that sound. And so I'm not sure if that's the scales moving against each other or, uh, or something else going on. I'm sure it's not the mouth snapping shut or anything like that, but there is kind of a little, a little snap sound. I, I guess my question was in terms of medical significance. If you're bitten by by these uh, the small, the miniature vipers, are, is it a trip to the hospital? Probably not. Probably just going to be miserable for you know a day or two on the trip. Uh, I think you. Uh, I don't know exactly. You could get on Johan's uh, Snake Bite uh, African Snake Bite Institute website and look at the medical significance of those bites, but I would imagine it would be like getting bit by a very small sidewinder or something like that. Uh, I missed a question uh, by Miles Traphagen, and he asks, um, do you know the general average rainfall uh, there? Obviously, there's a wide range. I guess he wants to know uh, what rainfall is like. Yeah, so on the, uh, on the, on the northern and southern sand sea, so on uh, uh, coastal Namibia, the Benguela current goes up that west coast and it's very, very cold. And that 
bank of cold air prevents clouds from moving inland, creating this really dry climate. And that Benguela current's apparently been in position for millennia and basically has precipitated this whole arid environment that you see in Namibia and uh, 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 in particular. And so um, rainfall there, most of it uh, falls in the amount of fog or comes in precipitation in the amount of fog, if you can call that precipitation. And if I recall, you're looking at under two inches annually for that part. Now you move inland and you get, uh, you know, towards Windhoek and stuff and you're in Mapani woodland and as you move up towards the Merriam Fluce and there's very strong seasonal rains there that can be really significant. And I still want to think the rainfall would be very akin to what we'd have in Arizona, probably in that six to eight inch range in most of that country. All right. Um, so, um, oh, how many herps do you find under Welwitchia? Is it a significant habitat um, for herps? I I, unfortunately, I found precious little under Welwishia. And of course, you know, you don't want to do anything to damage the plant. They look like they're barely making it as it is. They're, they've got to be god awful tough. But I've never seen one that actually looked like it only had two leaves on it, except for when they were very small because the leaves get tattered and shredded. But uh, uh, I have found uh, different uh, little geckos under there on occasion. And, uh, and I've had things like some of the... Um, um, Rollies and whatnot, uh, uh, and Pediaplanus in particular, hide under those. Pediaplanus are a lot like the whip tails, a little asserted. Uh, and so I've had them run under there, see a lot of beetles under there, but uh, I don't think I've ever found a snake under one. And uh, oftentimes in some of those gravel plains, they're about the only cover there is visible for as far as you can see. So um, you've got the, a Mars-like landscape punctuated by the odd Welwishia every, you know, hundred meters or more in some places. And uh, so you think that everything would gravitate towards them, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, we have a question from a researcher, uh, Dan Rowe. And uh, is, are there, is there any additional details, context, pictures of the O. cataphractus and S. giganteus. Any work or experience with collecting smog Mozambicus? Uh, he's, yeah, so, oh, yeah, uh, he's working with various Cordylidae and would appreciate any environmental and behavior details you could share. The waterhole detail was very interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mozambicus I've seen in uh, in up in higher elevations and uh, little rock outcrops, a lot like if you're familiar with uh, Scoloporus uh, tristicus or uh, any of those smaller scoloporine lizards, similar type habitats, but rock not down trees or logs or anything like that. Uh, cataphractus, uh, it's a funny animal in that uh, you'll be in fairly rolling or um, open Karoo type habitat and there will be little rock dikes. Basically they're elongated strings of rocks, not very complex, very simple. And you'll walk out there and look in basketball size rocks with a crevice and there's cataphractus in there and uh, they're family groups. So more often than not, you'll see, you know, I've seen up to seven, I think in a crevice and uh, but typically three two or three something like that occasionally one and so not very significant at all uh small guy or the giganteus the big uh sun gazers those are uh if you're in arizona uh it looks like the wilcox type habitat out there on the big grassy plains like you see in chihuahuan desert scrub type situations uh the occasional shrub or tree out in the very open plains. And then the lizards are digging a burrow that's fairly substantial, maybe um, uh, six or so inches across the opening. And they uh, come out and lay near the entrance during the day. And sharing that burrow might be a female or a young 
So there could be two or three animals in that same burrow and they're all very watchful and retreat back down into it any, any sign of, uh, of uh, disturbance. Uh, so um, all of them seem to be very wary. Uh, you see them out basking, uh, but you, they're difficult to approach without them, them taking off. Now those, that uh, um, big sun gazer, uh, if you move carefully and closely, we could approach within six or eight feet of them without them, uh, without them, you know, darting back down into the burrow, but you had to kind of take your time to do it. So there's this uh, young student here asking a question named Cecil Schwalbe. Uh, <laughs> he, he wants, this is related to Miles's question. He wants to know um, if ambient temperatures there are as much above average as ours are here. Gee, Cecil, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, uh, uh, I was there uh, the year before all this wheels fell off the cart with this uh, um, uh, COVID thing. And um, uh, it gets, it definitely gets warm up in that Northern Namibia, north of the Tropic of Capricorn and stuff. But you know, the whole time you're on that coast, I've I'm just freezing my buns off. I'm, it's, it's cold all along that coast yet. There's such a rich herp diversity there. And so uh, I, I may not, you know, being a desert guy, I may not be the best guy to ask that because a lot of times if I'm near the coast, I think it's way too cold for anything. But again, those things are up and moving. And uh, uh, now I'm kind of curious to write Johan and, uh, maybe uh, uh, Graham Alexander and a few of those other guys and ask them what their temperatures are doing, if they're seeing that. <clears throat> I know Mike Robinson is on this uh, Zoom call and he might be able to. Yeah, Mike would be a great guy. Yeah. <clears throat> but he can, are you there? Yeah, yeah. hi. Hi Randy, hi. I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks Mike. Um, the fog, where the fog desert is, it is cold <clears throat> and it's very seasonal. But even in, in the clear time when there's no fog, um, and by the way, the fog only reaches about uh, 60 kilometers inland and is greatest on the coast. So in terms of the temperature, even the hottest days in the Namib desert, the parts that I was in, um, be 100 degrees, 105, and uh, they think that's horrible. <laughs> uh, so it's a cooler desert, even without the fog on, on, a, on a sunny day in the summer. Uh, the, the sand, of course, heats up to be, be a greater temperature. The ambient is, uh, is very comfortable to work in compared to what we have here. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see, do you have any idea how uh, herps were viewed by the native people there, Randy? Were they a source of food or lore or anything like that? Yeah, you know, um, uh, there's a great story, uh, just so story kind of thing about uh, the chameleon and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, native peoples will uh, kill everyone they see and they stuff their mouth with sand and sometimes show them, sew them shut. And that story goes back, or that the reason they do that goes back to a story that I was told. So how true this is, I'm not sure, but I was told by a, a actually fairly intoxicated uh, 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 Afrikaans guy uh, that I was with. And uh, basically in the beginning of time, uh, people, you know, were down here on the planet and they're, they're raising a ruckus, making a big, uh, lots of noise and God gets tired of it. And so he calls his animals over and he says, uh, you know, I need somebody to go down there, tell those folks to shut up and, uh, you know, keep it down. And to, uh, to prove I'm serious about this, the first person they tell is going to die. And, uh, and so, he unwisely chooses the chameleon to deliver this message. So the chameleon starts on his way and 
you know how chameleons move. They don't get anywhere very fast, kind of that wobbly back and forth, back and forth step, wobble back and forth step. So the chameleon takes off and they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait. And eventually God just gets tired and, call, and, and picks the hoopoo and says, go down there and tell those guys to, to keep it down. So the hoopoo goes, delivers the message right away. Somebody drops dead. Everybody gets a message to behave. Well, the chameleon is still on his way to deliver that message. And if he ever comes up and gives you the message, it's all over. So the whole idea is to stop the chameleon before it speaks. And, uh, and whether that's the whole myth behind the whole thing, but it, it, they do, they are awful hard on chameleon dilepis and some of the other ones. Um, when I've been in Zim, uh, the folks are really practical about a lot of the snakes, the mambas, the cobras, other things, uh, the big pythons, they just kind of let them alone. And even had people come up and knock on the door and say, oh, there's a spinning cobra in your rock pile in your garden there, uh, um, you know, just to let us know. And so uh, really interesting, very unlike a lot of folks out here that just kill everything right off the bat. And so, um, you know, I, I guess the real answer to your question is that I see uh, from kind of just a detached uh, interest in them to downright hostility. But for the most part, I don't see a lot of people killing stuff, uh, wanton killing with the exception of the Afrikaans people and the supposedly more educated and uh, folks that should know better. We have a mammal uh, question here that I'll, I'll attach my mammal question to. Um, Sean Daniels asks, what's the most uh, common potentially dangerous mammals you've encountered? And then my question is, is the elephant shrew uh, an actual shrew in the, in the shrew family? Yeah, so uh, second question first, they're not an actual shrew. They're off in their own little uh, family, and I can't remember the name of it, but it uh, proboscis figures into the name. And depending on which one it is, they're in they're spread out through several different genuses or genera. Um, the uh, dangerous animals, you know, uh, as Cecil can tell you, uh, elephants are always problematic, and, uh, and uh, you hate to get caught away from places with a, a big elephant around. But for the most part, um, I you know the big mammal problem is is not a real issue. So a lot of the lions are on parks and uh, things like that anymore, as are most of the elephants and rhinos and whatnot um, in the parks. Even though we've got permits to do some collecting there, for the most part, we weren't out at night because they wouldn't let us out at night. Um, I worry about leopards a little bit uh, every now and then in some of that country. They're pretty widely uh, uh, spread are dispersed and they can persist in really uh, degraded habitats. But uh, I think that attacks from le leopards are very unusual. So um, really don't worry about much of those things. I think I worry about Africanized bees like I do over here uh, more than I do any of the mammals. Um, two more groups. Um, uh, I forget who asked this. Um, Eric Russell asks, um, how much time have you spent in Southern Africa? What time of year is, is best to visit for the herps? And Hill Johnson asks, um, in announcing this talk, you're photographed with a pangolin. Did you find many pangolins? Uh, no, no, so second question first, no, I, we did not find any pangolins in that. Uh, somebody said, <laughs> your friend said, you look happier holding that pangolin than you did your daughter. And, uh, and I'm just gonna to decline to comment on that. Uh, the uh, pangolin was something I wanted to see my entire life. So they're real heavily persecuted in uh, Southeast Asia where we do the surveys in Vietnam and likewise in Africa. And I wish to heavens I could say I was out wandering around and found that pangolin, but actually uh, I was near Binhook and um, some uh, game wardens, basically uh, wildlife enforcement people showed up, we were photographing a snake and they happened to show up right on the road, we were on the dirt road and parked next to us and they had this pangolin to release that they had seized. And uh, I was 
you know, forgot all about the snakes, of course, and started following Pangan around. And I asked if it was okay if I picked it up and they kind of gave me a look like, why would you ever want to pick up a pangolin? But uh, I couldn't not. So uh, yeah, that was the picture of me holding the pangolin. I was very, very happy, very excited to see it. Uh, there is some work in Namibia where they're radio transmitting them, um, uh, have radio transmitters on them and are uh, doing telemetry stuff, finding some pretty neat stuff about them. Uh, and uh, that's up near, that's I think in the southern third of the country, uh, right about at that southern uh, third line. And, uh, but none of it occurring in South Africa uh, proper that I know of. Um, the other question was, uh, I forget. It's time to visit. Oh, yeah, so it's prime herping time there right now because it's south of the equator and it's summer. So uh, um, a lot of the surveys we were doing, we were doing during our summer, which was right in the middle of their winter. Um, and so we were doing them in June and July, uh, working with Dr. Bauer and Dr. Lamb, and uh, we uh, and we did well. Uh, but sometimes the nights would be cool, and sometimes you uh, uh, didn't have much weather uh, as far as rain or anything like that. But very rarely you would get a storm move in. But for the most part, very good weather. Uh, I would think that depending on what you want to do, you would want to go like right around now. And uh, in Southern Africa, the rains are starting, so you're gonna see a lot of really magnificent frogs, things like the bullfrogs and rubber frogs and reed frogs and things like that, plus uh, good herps on the roads and things out, higher humidities. Uh, I often have been there in October, which is really like our April-ish, and you can start doing pretty well road riding then. Uh, but you be advised, snakes are, tough to come by no matter what time of year you're there. Have you heard the little rain frog squeak defensively? Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, you can't not like rain frogs. They are just awesome. They are just really a lot of fun. I mean, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen a mate, but when they're glued to the, the male secrete a sticky substance from their the lower abdomen and they glue themselves to the back of the females because their arms aren't big enough to reach around and and, and plex properly and uh, you'll see them occasionally with a big female bouncing around with that little male glued to the back he's just kind of like a well he's not like a red dog rag dog because he's puffed up but his legs are flayed out to the side and she's just kind of dragging them along it's they're really remarkable animals some of them will uh, actually breed right at the high tide mark along the coast, which just blows me away because you think that'd be too saline for them. So yeah, they're remarkable animals. <clears throat> I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, if anyone has a question now, uh, it'd be good to ask. Otherwise, I think we're at the end. Yes, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, Bob. Um, I uh, thought I put a question in the chat, but it doesn't matter. I don't mean to put uh, Randy on the spot about DNA on such a wonderful talk, but um, one of the questions that people often have about, about uh, Namibia in general is how, okay, this is a very ancient desert, uh, and presumably all these pachydactyl species are fairly uh, ancient. Is there anything that, say, Bauer is get, picking up in the DNA that suggests that some of the species may have separated, diverged, relatively recently? Uh, you know, compared, here we have a North American desert where things are extremely young. Or is everything, uh, the differences between the species, are they all ancient in, in this uh, Namib environment, Kalahari environment? Wow, for not wanting to put me on the spot, you did a great job, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's great. I, I know you're not a DNA no, drawer. No, yeah, yeah I am not, I'm not great with genetics, but you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the Aaron would be the, and Trip would be the best guys to ask about that. Now in their review of pachydactyl geckos, uh, there's a lot of trees in there, 
And uh, I remember when I read through that, you know, looking at the different clades and uh, separations, but I don't remember separation times and whether they were all old or if there's any recent okay. stuff. Yeah. And one other little follow up. Is a, is a museum in Vintook uh, still active down there? Last time I was there, they were. And uh, um, the, uh, there's a new herpetologist in, uh, in Vindhook. Um, and uh, the person's from the U.S., I, I'm, their name's escaping me right now, but they are, uh, uh, I think, a little bit easier to work with than Mike Griffin was. Um, uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, but uh, really that change took place after we'd finished everything, you know, and, and once Mike got to know you, he's very helpful. I think Mike retired into, into Mexico. So uh, 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 the, the museum, the collection's all there. There's, you know, you, you can access it fairly easy. Um, I don't know about these times with COVID, but uh, uh, I've been in the museum several times and it's just a wonderful place. Thank you. It was an absolutely excellent talk and beautiful uh, images. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. That's very kind of you. Uh, Randy, where's this? What's the source of the sand? Is it from the Congo or? Uh, no, I think I, I think it's basically, if I remember correctly, uh, um, I think it's basically you know uh, marine resource or marine sand that has come piled up. Matter of fact, yeah, you ought to ask Mike Robinson because he'll remember even though I'm not recalling correctly. Mike, do you want to chime in on that? Uh, that's my understanding also. Most of it is marine sand, but in the further toward away from the sea, there are smaller dune areas that appear to be eroded off the, uh, off the mountains of Vindhoek. Th that would make sense, you know, because you get these, uh, one of the things there that, that Mike remembers or you've other folks that have been there, uh, you get different colored of dunes, uh, different colored dunes. So you've got red sand dunes, you've got things, and some of that looks like eroded out sandstone type of stuff. But some of those sandy pockets like uh, that Mike's talking about are, some of those sand fields are relatively small. And, uh, and so uh, uh, I guess a variety of sources, but uh, would make sense. But I think my last question will be, um, these really delicate geckos with really thin skin and, and small, the, the attenuate species, where do they hide? I mean, do they, do they actually go, do they bury themselves in the sand? They just seem so delicate. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing about uh, like the um, Southern Sand Sea and uh, uh, places in Namibia there where, that you're in. Um, a lot of these geckos, and and uh, and Mike may be able to speak to this much better than I. They appear to be relatively nomadic in that they seem to wander across these dunes, and wherever they end up uh, for the night, then they burrow down in the sand. So pal palmetto geckos will dig a little crescent-shaped burrow. It's a little half-moon-shaped burrow, and it goes down in there, and you can dig them up. Uh, Cox barking geckos I've dug out of the sand by digging up burrows. Um, uh, a lot of these geckos like chondrodactylus appear that they don't have a, a regular stable burrow that they, they, they construct a new one every night. The soils are really frayable and often after you get past the loose crust or the loose surface, there's a rather firm uh, compaction of sand that's very easily dug in, but it will hold the shape of a burrow. And, uh, and I believe most of them, again, just seem to dig a new burrow every night. Is that your experience, Mike? You were there at Goba, Beb. I, that's basically right, Randy. And I, I just throw in, if you go over to the Middle East, the, the Arabian sand dune system, <clears throat> there's a whole nother suite of those delicate, thin-skinned, bleached out geckos <laughs> with expanded toe pads and so forth. So there's, there's some beautiful convergent evolution there. That, that's the genius. Be they do or just flat sand plains. And, and that's that stenodactylus genus? 
Excuse me? Is the genus on that, is that Stenodactylus on those? Yes, that's, that's one of them. They've, uh, with, the, with the DNA, they've juggled a, a few of them around. They all used to be in sort of one genus or, or two. And last time I looked up, there were about three or four different genera, and, and they might well be different, but um, I believe a lot in convergent evolution, having seen uh, herpetofaunas of different parts of the world, and uh, uh, they, may, they may be different genera. I, I just don't really know. But it, that phenotype is, is a dead ringer in the sand dune areas, as far as I'm concerned. We don't have it here. This, this younger desert. We don't have it here. Best thing we have is an Uma, which looks like a giant, uh, um, I called it Aprosaurus. It's now Moroli's Cuny rostrus. It just looks like a giant addition of that <laughs> in Namibia. It amazes me how such small, thin skinned creatures don't just desiccate. Um, in one day after just being out exposed to the elements like that. So they must have very uh, unique uh, mechanisms to keep from, from desiccating. I, I imagine, uh, and Mike's done, you know, a lot of physiological stuff with these things, but I, I imagine, you know, those burrows afford them a higher humidity environment. And then oftentimes at, uh, at night, you know, with those fog, uh, events uh, on the coast, you know, they're, they're getting that again and, uh, and able to drink. I know that uh, somewhere in my field notes up there, I've got body temperatures on 15 or 20 uh, uh, carps barking geckos during a fog event, and they were cold enough to where that uh, the fog was condensating on them. And so they were substantially cooler than the air temperature. And if I remember right, the air temperature was something like right around 42 or something like that. And uh, But again, you would see all kinds of animals out there. And, and I think the main thing is just avoiding the diurnal desiccating winds and sun and being out when the, the it's basically like a cactus photosynthesizing at night. Uh, you just have these animals that are avoiding the harsh times and and activities confined to the more amenable periods. Is that your take on it, Mike? <clears throat> yeah, you get 10 centimeters deep in a sand dune and uh, it's, uh, it's a reasonable temperature. And that's where those guys spend the day. Well, Randy, thank you so much. Everyone uh, is, has really enjoyed your talk based on all the comments we're getting uh, in the chat box. And I'm clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. That's yeah. It's so great to see you. It's so great to see all of our out of town members and offer these talks to them. Uh, we're definitely reaching a much wider audience. And uh, we get to hear from, from other experts chime in at, in uh, the discussion, which is really wonderful. So um, Randy, you did a great job. We really, really appreciate your, your presentation and uh, hope to have you in the future. Well, thank you very much. It's so nice seeing Wit and Mike and Cecil and uh, Bob, everybody again. And, uh, and uh, let's hope this thing's over soon so we can all get out and play together again. That's what I'm really looking forward to. Thank you. All right. I'm going to now end the meeting unless there are any last minute things. Karen Watkins says hello to